All right, welcome everyone. It's certainly good to be back. I hope you are in, uh, enjoying this class thus far, and just want to let you know that we are in class two, part two, uh, part three of hermeneutics, and we're going to be spe specifically be looking at hermeneutical agnosticism. Hermeneutical agnosticism. Now I know you're thinking well, that's some big words, but you already know what hermeneutics is. It's a science or the art of how to interpret the scriptures. You may have never heard the term agnosticism. Agnosticism is a person who believes that propositional knowledge is not knowable. Now, specifically, when we talk about agnosticism, usually it's in regards to, okay, there's the atheist who believes that God, he knows God does not exist. Then you have the agnostic who is on the fence, so to speak. He doesn't know whether or not God does exist. And then you have, of course, the theist, the one who does believe that God exists. So when we think about hermeneutical agnosticism, then we're specifically talking about someone who believes we cannot know how to interpret the Bible correctly. And that's very important when we discuss this matter, because if we cannot know what the Bible teaches, then it's worthless continuing this class. When you really think about it, there's no way we can continue in this class. And yet, I bet already you've learned some things that you can apply. So there are some things that we can know, and therefore we know this position is false already. But it's very important to nevertheless deal with this because there are people who unfortunately uh, believe in this idea, false idea. Okay? So... If we can know God exists, well, how, how do you know God exists? Well, like I told you before, I think there's three great arguments. Design, cause and effect, and the moral argument. And when you think about the design argument, for example, if there is order, arrangement, and purpose in the, and we're going to look at something specifically, then there is design. And I think when you look at uh, AP has been putting out some really good um, uh, videos on the design of certain animals. So you got like the electric eel, the godwit, the molly fowl, the cuttlefish. So let's just take the molly fowl, for example. So if there's order, arrangement, and purpose in the molly fowl, then there is design. There is order, arrangement, and purpose in the molly fowl. And I would really highly suggest that you watch this video. Therefore, there is design. And if there's design in the Mali file, then there is a designer. There must be a designer. And it, there is design in the Mali file. Therefore, there is a designer. And you can see with each of these, we could talk about the cuttlefish, the electric eel, and the goblet. It's really amazing how everything, everything's been designed and therefore demands a designer. So when we think about the existence of God, if we can know God exists, and if we can know that the Bible is the Word of God, and so that is, you know, I know this is a, we would be doing a Christian evidences course re with regards to this, but like I say, with presuppositions, you have to, this all has to fit together. And so how do we know the Bible is the Word of God? Well, I'm going to give one example of this. This argument was a. Uh, it's made famously by Brother Thomas B. Warren, and it's a, a really great argument. So the major premise would be, if it is the case that the Bible possesses predictive prophecy, sign. Uh, well, and what we would have here is, if it's the case that the Bible possesses properties, that are, wherein the total situation involved in having such properties make it clear the Bible is beyond mere human production then the Bible is the Word of God. So it is the case that the Bible possesses property A, B, C, up to Z. And what we would put properties would be predictive prophecy, scientific foreknowledge, the unity of the Bible. <laughs> then the Bible is the Word of God. That's how we would make this argument. So just looking at it again, if it's the case that the Bible possesses property A, Okay, well, it is the case that the Bible possesses predictive prophecy that makes it clear the Bible is beyond mere human production. Ezekiel 26 through 28 is a great example of this. 
therefore, is a case that the Bible is the Word of God. And what I really suggest you do is watch this video here, The Prophecy of Tyre, Proof for God. And it's a good, good video of showing of, of, of amazingly how God predicted the downfall of Tyre using Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander the Great. So just to give you an example of this, let's just look at Isaiah 41, 22 through 23. All right, and I, I'm going to ask you to read Ezekiel 26 through 28 later. But I think it's important to discuss this. Isaiah 41. So primarily Isaiah 40 through 48 is a, it's a polemic against the false gods in that it shows how greater the God of Israel is more than these false idols. Um, Isaiah 41, 22 and 23 says, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them, and know the latter end of them, or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. So, see, if one can predict the future that we may know that you are gods. So that's one of the arguments, is that the true God can predict the future because he is infinite in knowledge. And he knows the past and the present and the future. So Ezekiel 26 through 28 uh, is three chapters that talk about Tyre. And it's very important to study why, why did they crumble as a nation? Well, because of sin, because of pride, because of what they had done, and they would not repent. And one of the things that's talked about is pride and violence. If you want to look at Ezekiel 26, 16 through 18, it says, Then all the princes of the sea will come down from their thrones, lay aside their robes, Take off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground, tremble every moment, and be astonished at you. Talking about Tyre. They will take up a lamentation for you and say to you, How you have perished, O one inhabited by seafaring men, O renowned city, who was strong at sea, she and her inhabitants, who caused their terror to be on all her inhabitants. Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall. Yes, the coastlands by the sea are trim troubled at your departure. So pride and violence. And what's interesting is when it comes to predictive prophecy, there's always three things involved. You got timing, you got significant timing. So you just can't, you know, uh, it's going to rain tomorrow. No, it's got to be something uh, into the future. Um, and then... It's also got to be specific details. So details, if you were to read the look at this, Nebuchadnezzar destroys villages. Nebuchadnezzar builds a siege mound. Many nations come up against Tyre. City flattened like a top of a rock. There'll be stones and timber and soil laid in the sea. It becomes a place where men spread nets, and it's to never be rebuilt. And so, interesting enough, the details are fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar lays a siege against Tyre for 14 years in 330 B.C., so 300 years later or so. Uh, well, uh, about 300 years later. Alexander the Great comes along. He, lay, he does a nine-month siege against the city, and the Tyrians had moved out to the island city. So Alexander decided to take the timber, the stone, and build a land bridge toward the island city, and Tyre was scraped clean like a rock. So you see predictive prophecy and people do fish there they cast uh people cast their nets there and the city has never been rebuilt so in regards to now the existence of god moving on to the inspiration canonization of the bible which we far we, which we've dealt with that the bible is inspired because of predictive prophecy we could look at more evidences than that and if we can know, and this is very important, the blue part is very important. If 
we can know the Bible teaches X, where X is any true Bible proposition. Okay, so that's where this comes into play. The authority of the Bible, harmonics and exegesis, if we can know the Bible teaches X, where X is any true Bible proposition. So I'm going to use an example here of that the Bible teaches that water immersion is essential for salvation in the Christian dispensation. And if we can prove that to be the case, then we can know that the Bible teaches water immersion is essential for salvation in the Christian dispensation. Dispensation is true. So here's how I would go about with the second premise. So as you can see all of this, and we have various verses here. Now we're not going to cover all these verses, but there's quite a few verses that I do want to look at that I think are very, very important to establishing the case for this. So number one, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, the main verb here is make disciples. And then we have these participles, present participles. Uh, sorry, no, 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 not present. It's present, yeah, present participles, as I thought. Present participles, baptizing. So it usually ends with ing and teaching. So what Matthew is trying to present to us is make disciples. How do you make disciples? You baptize them by baptizing them and by teaching them. Okay. Now, here's what a Greek present participle means. Now, remember the New Testament is written in Greek, but Obviously, this is, can be pre, really understood in English, but it's really great to go back to the Greek language, which is one of our three tools, right? Original languages. And you can see it, um, you can see it even here. So present participles indicate action that occurs at the same time as the action of the main verb. Now, what was our main verb? Make disciples make disciples. Okay, well, let's keep going. So here are some people who were Greek scholars, and notice that some of these, uh, some of these men are in, in the denominations. And so here we have a Presbyterian theologian, and look at what Macon says. He says, the present participle, therefore, is used if the action denoted by the participle is represented as taking place at the same time as the action denoted by the leading or the main verb, no matter where the action denoted by the leading verb is past, present, or future. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Ray Summers says this, the time of action in participles is indicated in the relation of the action of the participle to the action of the main verb. The present participle indicates action which is contemporaneous with the action of the main verb. Okay, let's go a little further. Dana and Manti, they say, simultaneous action relative to the main verb is ordinarily expressed by the present. Okay, A.T. Robertson. The present participle gets its time from the principle or the main verb. All right, James Hadley. The participles denote time relative, relatively to the, that of the verb on which they depend, the main verb. The present and perfect participles denote time relatively present. The aorist participle, time relatively past. The future participle, time relatively future. William Goodwin, the tenses of the participle are present, past, or future relatively to the time of the verb, which would be make disciples in this case, 
with which they are connected. William Mounts. The time of the participle is relative to the time of the main verb. The present participle describes an action occurring at the same time as the main verb. Now, <laughs> do y'all get the idea? I hope, I hope you do. Now, I want to discuss something I think that's very important before we go on to this. I'm going to go back here. Some, and, it, and you can see how this could easily happen. In fact, I might have um, thought this way. So sometimes there's been this error in our thinking that people have said, okay, make disciples. Why? And then what, making disciples, well, you're going to teach them, right? And then you baptize them. And then you teach them some more. That is not what's going on here. And I want to make that very clear. Now, are we baptized before we are taught? Because as you can see here, interesting enough, it why does it have baptizing and teaching? Well, because in the Greek language, it's very flexible. Word order doesn't really matter. Okay. And I like what Hendrickson says here, he says, in such a construction, it would be completely wrong to say that because the word baptizing precedes the word teaching, therefore people must be baptized before they are taught. And, and he's right. The concepts baptizing and teaching are simply two activities in co coordination with each other, but both subsor subsordinate means they are under to make disciples. In other words, by means of being baptized and being taught, a person becomes a disciple. Now we're going to, I like what Dave Miller, he brought some good examples up in his book where this comes from. So the example would be, go make disciples. I'm going to make disciples. Go make pancakes. <laughs> go make pancakes, mixing the batter in the porcelain bowl, pouring it on the griddle. All right, I bet you can identify the main verb here, right? Make pancakes. And what would be our present participles? It'd be mixing the batter and pouring it on the griddle. Okay, that's how you make pancakes, right? So that's what we see there. All right, now, how do we make pancakes? Well, we mix the batter and the porcelain bowl and we pour it on the griddle. That's how you make pancakes. Now, here's the interesting thing. What's the main verb? Make disciples. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. But we recognize that, like we said, it's word order is flexible in Greek language. So we know that someone has to be taught before baptism because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So you must believe. If you believe I'm not he, you will die in your sins. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we see the importance here of, of course, it's flexible. All right. How do you make disciples? Baptizing them and teaching them. Okay. Um, G.R. Beasley notes this, he said, Murray says, the participles describe the manner in which a disciple is made. It is when a hearer believes and is baptized that he becomes a full disciple, which is the same as saying that a disciple is made such in baptism by faith. Baptizing belongs to the means by which a disciple is made. So, we ask this question, friends, can pancakes, can they be made without mixing batter? No. Can they be made without pouring the batter on the griddle? No. Well, can pancakes be made without pouring them uh, on the, the batter on the griddle? Let's say we don't even mix the batter. Well, you gotta have it. You gotta have it mixed, right? It's gotta be mixed and it's gotta be poured on the griddle. Okay. So, can disciples of Christ be made without teaching and baptizing them? 
The answer is no, you cannot. So, very interesting enough, I think we see here, how do we make disciples? By, of course, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to look at this word in here. This is the Greek word ace. This is the same Greek word that's used in Acts 2.38. So, baptizing them in the you're in this location in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The name there is very interesting. So here's what R.T. French says. The ace, which introduces the baptismal formula in Matthew 28, 19, and in most of the new, other New Testament baptism texts, is perhaps to be understood as drawing attention to the new relationship and allegiance into which the one baptized is thus introduced. And he also says, implying entrance into an allegiance. That's what the ace describes. And then Moulton says, the phrase ace to anomatinas into the name is frequent in the papyri with a reference to payments made to the account of anyone. The usage is of interest in connection with Matthew 28, 19 where the meaning would seem to be baptized into the possession of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As Suter says, when the preposition ace with a noun in the accusative, which just means the direct object, follows, it appears to indicate that through this ceremony, the baptized person becomes the property of, becomes the property of the person indicated after ace. You see what he's saying there? When you are baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you become the property of God. You belong to Him. It's to Him you owe your allegiance. It's to Him that you have a new relationship. So, I think that's a good argument to show why baptism is essential for salvation in the Christian dispensation. But I want to use another one, because when we're discussing with denominational people, they often will say, well, you ask them, at what point are you, sa are you justified? And they'll say, by belief. But we need to understand what is true faith. And the Bible gives us the answer, friends. If we just Look very closely. Now, what I want to do is I'd like to look at Acts 16, 29 through 34, in which we've looked at this before, I believe. But I want us to look at it in another light. Okay, so we're talking about the Philippian jailer. And it says, Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved, you and your household. But what does it mean to believe? Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced. Now notice this, having believed in God with all of his household, this is a perfect participle. This is very important to understand. So here's what Dana and Manti say about this. The perfect is the tense of complete action. Its basal significance is the progress of an act or state to a point of culmination and the existence of its finished results. That is, it views action as a finished product. It implies a process, but views that process as having reached its consummation and existing in a finished state. I'm going to go to another Greek scholar. The Greek perfect participle indicates a completed action with a resulting state of being. 
the primary emphasis is on the resulting state of being. Involved in the Greek perfect are three ideas. An action in progress. It's very important. It's coming to a point of culmination. It's existing as a completed result. Thus, it implies a process, but looks upon the process as having reached a consummation and existing as a completed state. Okay? So notice here, this is exactly what, what happens to the Philippian jailer. He goes through a process of showing true faith, true saving faith. Remember, he, they said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will, and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and all were in his house. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. He took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, right? So Paul and Silas teach him the word of God. He shows repentance. He washed their stripes, right? Acts 17.30, these times of ignorance God once overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. They, he is showing an act of faith, of repentance. And immediately he and his family were baptized. Baptism is an act of faith. Now, when he had brought them into his house, right? So the Jan family were immediately immersed. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. Friend, he rejoiced, having believed in God, because this is a process which began here which reaches a culminating point. And which is that? When be, you're baptized into Christ. That's how where you contact the blood of Jesus that washes away your sins. That's where you enter in and find all spiritual blessings. You find salvation is in Christ. It's really that simple, friends. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that's exactly what he did. He went through a process that reached a culminating point. It's that simple, friends. Uh, I like what Knowing says. Knowing says. He says the word pespatukos, which is having believed, perfect participle, shows that this fullness of joy was caused by his full, notice that, full profession of belief. It was the joy of the Holy Ghost which followed his baptism. All right, so I think you can see here that we have we could go through a lot of other verses. Be glad to, if we if we need to, but this is very very important to showing that the Bible teaches water immersion is essential for salvation in the Christian dispensation. So, I'm I believe this is a sound argument when we put all that together. So, remember, our main argument is, if we can know that the Bible teaches X, where X is any true Bible proposition, then we can know that X is true. And if we can know that the Bible teaches X, where X is any true Bible proposition, then we, know, then we can know that X is true. So, the, the hermeneutical agnostic is, he is going to uh, try to fight this premise here. He's going to fight this part right here. So that's what we're trying to look at. Can we know that the Bible teaches X, where X represents any true Bible proposition? And I believe the answer is yes, but we will need to show some arguments for that. So remember, a hermeneutical Gnostic is a person who holds the view that the interpreting the Bible is not knowable. Okay, so, in fact, we can argue against the general theory of agnosticism. I want to show this to be, this argument to be, uh, that agnosticism is not a, 
there's a okay so in philosophy you got uh, metaphysics the um, basically reality um, what to, what can we know about reality there's epistemology a study of knowledge and then you got values uh, axiology so if agnosticism is a true epistemological position then man does not have the ability to know Here's the thing. So let's just say we use this guy, Mr. Bob here. He's an agnostic. And he says, man cannot know what the Bible teaches on X. So the second premise would be agnosticism is a true epistemological position. Uh, it's a, a true epistem. I mean, a true, uh, that's a hard word to say. <laughs> I'll admit that. Notice that he's making an assumption here. He's already assuming what he believes to be true. Okay? So that's an assumption that he's making. There, and then, so this is his argument. Therefore, man does not have the ability to know. But see, this is self-contradictory. It blows itself up in the face. Is it true that to know that one cannot know? And you see the self-contradiction of that matter. Is it true? true that to know that one cannot know well, of course not that's just false if it is a case that agnosticism implies that man does not have the ability to know then in order to maintain that premise one must have knowledge so going back to mr agnostic here he says hey man cannot know what the bible teaches on x but a man must have knowledge in order to make that claim right so agnosticism affirms that man cannot know therefore it's false to affirm that man cannot know but a man must have knowledge in order to make that claim right and like i said i mean here's someone who's claiming they they cannot know but yet they do know at least one thing and it just blows up in their face it's self-defeating if man has the ability to know then agnosticism is a false epistemological position. Let me show you this. So we have a Mr. We have a Christian here. Uh, let's make him Frank. So Frank is a Christian. He says, man can know what the Bible teaches on X by logical reasoning, gathering the evidence, and drawing such conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. It's called the law of rationality. So I want to use an example here. Okay, this is a very simple example. Jehoash was the second of four kings who descended from Jehu to reign as king of Israel. Okay. He ruled from around 798 to 782 BC. So if you read your Bible, it says, In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoah, Jehoahaz, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 16 years. He also did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, but he walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, and all that he did, and the might with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat on his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Now, there's actually three things you can know about Joash. His defeat of Amaziah, king of Judah, near Beth Shemesh, which you'll find in 2 Chronicles 25. You'll find his interaction with the prophet Elisha, 2 Kings 13, 14 through 19. You'll find his subsequent battles against the Armenians, 2 Kings 13, 24 and 25. So, what's really interesting to me is what we find in archaeology. And this is a Tel Arima Stele of Adai Neri III. And this is what he says. Notice what he says. Adai Nerari, mighty king, king of the universe, king of Assyria, son of Samsi Adad, king of the universe, king of Assyria, the son of Samaneser, the king of the four quarters. I mustered my chariots, troops, and camps. I ordered them to march in the land of Hatti. 
In a single year, I shall do to the entire land of Amuru and Hattai. I impose upon them tax and tribute forever. I receive 2,000 talents of silver, 1,000 talents of copper, 2,000 talents of iron, 3,000 ta linen garments with multicolored trim, the tribute of Mari of the land of Damascus. I receive the tribute of Jehoash the Sumerian of the Tyrian ruler and of the Sidonian ruler. So, as you can see here, what can we learn from this? Man can know what the Bible teaches on X. Man can know what the Bible teaches on Jehoash. So, we gather the evidence, right? We draw such conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. Man can know what the Bible teaches on him, on Jehoash. He was a king of the northern kingdom. He was an evil king. He had interactions with the prophet Elisha. He had interactions with the king of Assyria. So if man has the ability to know, then Gnosticism is a false epistemological position. I'll try to say that as good as I can. Epistemological position. Epistemology. I mean, I just say epistemology to make it easier on myself. Man has the ability to know. Therefore, agnosticism is a false epistemological position. If agnosticism is a false epistemological position, the man does not have the ability to know. The man does have the ability to know. We've just learned three things about Jehoash, right? So I just it's false. Therefore, agnosticism is a false epistemological position. Notice this is what we call a modest tolerance. Now, this is one of the, basically some of the two main forms. So, if X, then Y. It negates Y, therefore it negates X. I'll say that again. If X, then Y negates Y, therefore it negates X. And that's what we see here. It is a valid argument, but it's also true. Because we do have the ability to know. We prove the second premise, but just learning about the life of Jehoash. All right, let's use another argument. So this would be our first premise. I'm going to take just a little break here. If human knowledge is possible, and if any given subject, X, is subject to human knowledge, and if a specific individual has the mental potential to conceive that subject X, then that subject X can be known. All right, now this is going to be our main, this is, you know, this is where the agnostic and I part ways. They'll say, no, human knowledge is not possible. But we're, human knowledge is possible, second premise. The specific subject, X, under consideration is subject to human knowledge. Fourth premise, the individual under consideration does have the mental potential to conceive the subject, X. Fifth premise, human knowledge is possible and the subject is subject to human knowledge and this individual does have the mental position, potential to conceive that subject. Conclusion, therefore the subject, X, is knowable. All right. Now, here's the thing. When we're looking at that second premise, all right, is human knowledge possible? There is evidence for this statement. And it's really simple. Either knowledge is possible or knowledge is not possible. All right. If human knowledge is not possible, then it's not possible to know whether or not the first statement is true or false. Right? We could we don't know if if it's not possible we cannot know whether this is true or false. But because such would be a denial of the law of excluded middle, which is an undeniable axiomatic truth, we must conclude therefore that knowledge is possible. <laughs> you see, like for example, the God of the Bible exists. The God of the Bible does not exist. There's the law of excluded middle. Both cannot be true. Either one is true and the other is false. The other is true and the other one's false. And the same thing here. Either knowledge is possible or it's not possible. But it is possible because if if human knowledge is not possible, then it's not possible to know whether or not this first statement is true or false. So that's why we 
think about the law of excluded middle. Now, these are called, uh, these are simple laws that we all think about we, we, uh, that are pretty simple. Like the law of identity, A is A equals A. It's raining equals it is raining. A car equals a car. A truck equals a truck. Pretty simple, right? Well, the law of excluded middle is A or not A. It's either raining or it's not raining. It's either a car or it's not a car. It cannot be both. Well, either human knowledge is possible to know or human poss knowledge is not possible to know. Okay, so that is the main thing here, right? And it, human knowledge is possible. And we could use Jehoash, right? If human knowledge is possible, and if any given subject like Jehoash is subject to human knowledge, and if a specific individual has the mental potential to conceive that subject, Jehoash, then the subject Jehoash can be known. And we learn a couple things. He had interaction with Elisha. He was a northern king of, of the kingdom of Samaria. He had interactions with the king of Assyria. So it is possible to know him. The specific subject under consideration is subject to human knowledge the individual under consideration does not does have the power the mental potential to conceive that subject therefore human knowledge is possible and this subject jehoash is subject to human knowledge and this individual does have the mental potential to conceive understand the subject this subject jehoash then is knowable okay but there's another argument we can use <clears throat> so let's go through it. If it is the case that agnosticism in biblical interpretation is true, then it follows that subjectivism in biblical interpretation will result. So when you think about it, agnosticism does imply subjectivism. Now, subjectivism is the doctrine that all knowledge is limited to experiences by the self and that transcendent knowledge is impossible. You know, you probably have heard people say, well, you can have many different interpretations of that passage. They are being subjective. So let's show this agnosticism is not true. If it is the case agnosticism in biblical interpretation is true, then it follows that subjectivism in biblical interpretation will result. Now, if subjectivism in biblical interpretation is practice, then it is entirely possible for one party to affirm a specific Bible proposition at the same time another party denies the same proposition, and both parties be equally right epistemologically. Now, think about that for a moment. So, subjectivism would say, okay, you got the Christian here, right? You got a person who's a Baptist. So, the Christian would say immersion in water for the mission of past sins under the Christian dispensation is essential for salvation. A Baptist, on the other hand, would say immersion in water for the mission of sin, past sins under the Christian dispensation is not essential for salvation. And yet subjectivism would both say that both of them are true. This is true and this is true. That's what subjectivism, subjectivism would say. But it's not possible for both parties, one affirming and the other denying the same proposition to be correct. Either one or the other has to be, or, or both, both could be wrong. That's a possibility. So if someone affirms immersion in water for mission of past sins and the Christmasization is essential for salvation, and then someone denies this, it's not essential for salvation, well, then you got the law of excluded middle here. It's either is or it's not, okay? Either is or it's not. Something is a case or something's not the case. That's what the law of excluded middle says. Well, we know the law of excluded middle is indeed true. It's true, friends. So, it is not possible for both parties, one affirming and the other denying the same proposition to be correct. Therefore, subjectivism in biblical interpretation is a false epistemological position. Now, if it's the case that subjectivism is false, then that also means that agnosticism is false because it implies subjectivism, right? 
So it is not possible for both parties, one affirming the other, denying the same proposition to be correct. Therefore, subjectivism is false, right? And therefore, agnosticism is false. So let's go back to this. It is not possible for both parties, one affirming the other, denying the same proposition to be correct. Therefore, subjectivism and biblical interpretation is false. And if subjectivism and biblical interpretation is false, then agnosticism is as an epistemological position in biblical interpretation. Interpretation is false because it implies subjectivism. I know that's a lot, and I understand that, but it's very important to see the main thing, the main thing. Keep the main thing, the main thing. And that is agnosticism, biblical agnosticism, uh, hermeneutical agnosticism is a false position to hold. And we've seen that. What can we learn from all this? We've learned that this argument is indeed valid and the premises are true. So we've established this as valid and sound because we can know certain things. So that's something we need to recognize. God demands that truth be taught. We see that over and over and over again. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We are to walk in truth. Third John verse four. Uh, as Jesus would say, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Second Peter one twelve says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things though you know and are established in the present truth. I may have said, said something wrong a little bit earlier. I think I said something to the nature of, I should have said, and I want to point this out, that either this is true or it's false. And either this is true or it's false. Um, I shouldn't have said, or both could be wrong because only one of these really honestly can be right. So I'm sorry for the confusion on that. But I thought I'd go ahead and uh, say that as a caveat. All right, Second Peter 1.12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things so you know and are established, though you know and are established in the present truth. First John 1 John 1.6-8. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And I have no greater joy than to hear my, that my children walk in truth. So God demands truth be taught, truth also be walked in, right? God demands error be refuted. We see that in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. You know, Jesus was being tempted by the devil, and Jesus would resort to the Word of God. He would say, it is written. It is written. And then, it for it is written. And that's what we need to refute error with the Word of God. We see here that there were those who were teaching that Gentile Christians must keep the law of Moses and physical circumcision. And Paul is refuting their error. And so that's, he says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him and called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you. Let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now, now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And then we see that truth and error are indeed distinguishable. As God would say, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. 
is not in heaven, that you should say he will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea, that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear and do it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. Indeed, God distinguishes between life and death, truth and error. And in God expects obedience to the truth. Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of incorruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. All right, so I hope that you learned a lot from uh, from hermeneutical agnosticism and how it's a false position, but there are other positions that we need to look at, and that is Roman Catholicism and biblical interpretation. So Roman Catholicism has said that the Bible is not for the common man. He cannot know what the scriptures teach. You got to go to the church. You got to go to the cardinals. You got to go to the bishops, the pope, for a proper interpretation of its contents. They'll say the common man just cannot go directly to the Bible for guidance. In fact, they'll use some verses like 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. So let's read this. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, they'll go here and they'll insert their false idea and say, and see, you, you cannot know what the Bible teaches yourself. You got to go to the higher up, the hierarchy in the church, in the Roman Catholicism. But notice this word for, gar, the reason. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy of scripture, it, a better interpretation, <laughs> of this is is of any origination, basically. It never originated in the mind of man. It came from the mind of God, from the Holy Spirit. That's what we need to learn from this. So Roman Catholicism is what they're saying is that the inspirer requires an inspired interpretation, but then they present their infallible interpretation in written form to the common man. Well, who's to say that their inspired interpretation doesn't need further interpretation? And they are assuming the ability to do what God apparently could not do, present a biblical interpretation that man can understand. And then we need to recognize that Roman Catholicism knows that if they propagandize their interpretations, keep the people ignorant of what the Bible actually says, then they can keep them in spiritual slavery. They don't want their people with enough knowledge to think for themselves. But as the Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And I would hope that all Roman Catholics would come out of that and become a member of the Lord's Church. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed class number two. We've really, I know, dived deep into some things, but they are very important to understand. So next time I'll be doing class three. I appreciate being with you. It was certainly a blessing, and you all have a great day.